It feels like a lifetime ago already, but it was this device that marked my first foray into the Android world. The Galaxy Note 2 was so different from any phone of that time, and it was exciting enough to get me to switch from iOS to Android. Eight years later, with the Galaxy Note 20 in hand, I asked myself, what was it about this phone that made me like it so much? Are these the same things that give the Note series its loyal following and do the same things apply in 2020? Or is this just another impressive yet unexciting Android smartphone? Hi, I'm Michael Josh. You're watching Gadget Match. This is our Galaxy Note 20 Ultra review. Playing with the Note 2 all over again reminds me of a time when Android was only just presenting itself as an alternative to iOS. At that time, there were many iPhone-like Android alternatives, and then there was the Galaxy Note. Back then, it was way bigger than your usual smartphone. It was fully specced out, and it came with a stylus. Suffice to say, this was the most extra smartphone the Android world had on offer in 2012. Fast forward to 2020, while there are not a lot of stylus-toting smartphones, big screens are all but the norm. Gaming phones lead the charge when it comes to performance power and battery life, and the most extra devices are the ones that fold. So why then should you buy the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra? Well, I'm fresh off the heels of reviewing many budget and mid-range smartphones, so let me start by putting this in context. At $1,300, the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra is pricey. But to answer the question of all the smartphones that I've reviewed this year, the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra is the most refined, most feature-packed all-rounder. Let me tell you why. It's really difficult to nitpick the display on a high-end Samsung phone. The Note 20 Ultra has one of the best displays you can get on a phone today. And for the spec-obsessed, you'll be happy to know that unlike last year's Note, the display on this phone comes with a fast refresh rate, double of what you'll find on an iPhone. The resolution can be maxed out to Quad HD, but there's a caveat, the two can't be used together. Out of the box, it's set to Full HD+, with motion smoothness set to adaptive. Another caveat, there's no way to have 120 hertz on all the time. The phone automatically switches based on what it thinks you need. Love it or hate it, the Note 20 Ultra keeps Samsung's signature curved display. It doesn't slope as much as on the Note 10, making it less intrusive and less susceptible to accidental taps. I don't mind it, but I can see why a flat slab would make more sense for a device billed as a note-taking device. There's an ultrasonic fingerprint scanner baked underneath it, which is fast and reliable. Also, it's the first phone to use Corning's new Gorilla Glass technology called Victus, which supposedly can survive two meter drops without shattering and is two times more scratch resistant. But don't ask me to verify, I'm pretty sure someone will address it very soon. If you're a Note user watching this, I have a question for you. How often do you use the S Pen and do you use it daily? Personally, as a longtime Note user, I'm fond of the S Pen. I love being able to scribble notes, the ability to annotate documents, and to occasionally use it as a remote camera trigger. But occasionally seems to be the operative word here. If I were to be honest, I'd buy the Note series because the S Pen is nice to have, not because I use it daily. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. On the Note 20 Ultra, latency has been improved significantly. It was pretty good already, and the differences are in the milliseconds. But any improvements that make it seem closer to writing on paper are welcome. And going back and comparing it to the Note 2, the differences are like night and day. The people who I think would benefit more from the latency improvements are artists, but I'd imagine that if you're really serious and intend to sketch or draw something, you'd get a device 
just like the iPad Pro or a Wacom tablet, something of that size. Like we talked about in our previous two videos, Air Actions now lets you navigate without having to touch your phone. But in my two weeks using the phone, I found them more as a novelty. Let me know if you disagree. I see many of you in the comments are not happy about the new placement of the S Pen, now docked on the left-hand side. While I do prefer the old side better, once I got used to it, it doesn't matter as much. I also like the improvements to Samsung Notes, things like being able to take voice notes from inside the app and being able to sync your notes with the cloud. That way, you can also access your notes on other devices like the Galaxy Tab S7 Pro. And soon, you'll be able to access your notes on Microsoft OneDrive, in Outlook. Voice notes and cloud syncing are available as an update to Samsung Notes and they're rolling out to all devices that support it. But the Note 20 Ultra comes with a few new features like folder structures, auto straightening your scribbles, and being able to adjust the size and color of your handwriting after the fact. While you could previously do this with third-party apps, you can now import PDFs into Samsung Notes so you can annotate them or sign documents. There's no word on whether these changes will make themselves onto older devices via an update. Now, while these updates to Samsung Notes aren't as sexy as, say, Air Actions, I much rather prefer them. Hopefully, Samsung is listening. I'd also love to see voice notes transcriptions too, like what you can do on the recording app on the Pixel. The camera system on the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra is the most well-balanced of all Samsung's current offerings. The phone has three cameras. It doesn't have that extra fourth camera for depth sensing like on the S20 Ultra, but it fixes the S20 Ultra's biggest problem, autofocus. With the addition of laser autofocus, where sometimes the S20 Ultra would struggle, the Note 20 does not. To really see how well the Note 20 Ultra's photos perform, we compared it to the Note 10 Plus, the S20 Ultra, the iPhone 11 Pro Max, and for fun, the $350 Pixel 4a. Let's see how well it does, shall we? Let's start with some flowers Chai got for her birthday. Take a look at the Note 20 Ultra's photo first. And then let's bring up the iPhone 11 Pro Max, which always does a superb job at accurately capturing colors. The photos are very close, except look over here at the white roses in the background. The Note 20 Ultra doesn't overexpose them, while the iPhone does. Now let's pull up the Note 10 Plus's photo. Colors are different, and the background not as creamy, while AI on the P40 Pro Plus kicks in and oversaturates the photo. More flowers, this time outdoors on an overcast morning in Manhattan. The Pixel 4a, iPhone 11 Pro Max, and the Note 20 Ultra shoot very similar photos with the Note producing creamier bokeh. The P40 Pro Plus again oversaturates, the S20 Ultra produces an almost identical photo, while the Note 10 Plus with its dual aperture lens picks f2.4, so the background is not as bokehlicious. We switch to the ultra wide angle lens for an HDR test. Marilyn Monroe in front of a church. What a juxtaposition. Again, you'll find the iPhone blows out the clouds on the top left, while the Note 20 Ultra doesn't. The other Samsung phones perform equally as good. Here's another ultra wide angle taken closer to sunset at the Empire Diner in Chelsea. Again, all three Samsung phones take similar photos, and I'd argue the iPhone takes the better shot by virtue of the details in the clouds. And finally, to Queens to get Jollibee for Chai's birthday. Only three phones in this example. The Note 20 Ultra best captures the mood of the day. Sticking with the ultra wide angle camera, let's try out portrait mode. Or on Samsung phones, live focus. Take a look at all our samples. Long story short, Chai says she'd use the Note 20 Ultra's photo on her Hinge profile. That's saying a lot. She says the same about the 2X portrait shot. Her face is brighter, her skin softer, but the overall photo is still sharp and blurry where it needs to be. Meanwhile, if I had a Hinge profile, I'd use the iPhone's photo, but I'll stop there because I know what you're about to say next. This might not be fair as each phone has a different amount of optical zoom, but let's just say when zooming up to 5x, the Note 20 Ultra is on top with the S20 Ultra and the P40 Pro Plus. Lots of detail in the shot taken from the opposite side of the street. 
Samsung doesn't market space zoom the way it did on the S20 Ultra. You can't zoom in to 100 times anymore, but even 50x is too much. So let's take a look at the scene from the Flatiron District and then zoom in to just 20x. Both phones did a similar good job. We're in Bryant Park for dinner, but first we capture the sunset in between New York's concrete jungle. We like the warmth in the Pixel's photo, but if you're looking at the clouds in the center of the photograph, there's not much detail on all three Samsung phones versus the Pixel and the iPhone. And if you're paying attention, you'll notice a trend here. In most examples in this shootout, when it comes to clouds on Samsung phones, they usually come out mushy. We make it to dinner, and of course, we start with a drink. Aperol Spritz, my favorite. And as it's getting dark, the Huawei phone shines as expected, producing a photo that belies the actual conditions. It's bright, crisp, and vibrant. The iPhone and the Samsungs produce similar shots, still good, but in a different league. Night mode kicks in for this next shot, a good test for photographing people in low light. Again, the P40 Pro Plus produces the best shot, but none of these are worthy of a dating app. When it comes to architecture, the results are closer. The Huawei still produces a brighter photo, but all these photos of the New York Public Library are post-worthy. Finally, we're on our way home via Grand Central Terminal. Here's the Note 20 Ultra's photo. The S20 Ultra's is similar as per usual. The Note 10 Plus's is brighter because the f1.5 side of its dual aperture lens kicks in under these conditions. The iPhones produces the most detail thanks to its 10 second exposure, more detail even than the brighter photo of the P40 Pro Plus. The $350 Pixel 4a holds its own, might even be a tiny bit better than the Note 20 Ultra, to be honest. And now on to video. One new feature that I think content creators are going to love is the new Pro Video Mode that allows for multiple microphone sources. This first clip is recorded using my lapel microphone connected to a wireless receiver connected to the phone via USB-C. Meanwhile, what you're hearing now is a recording using a Bluetooth microphone that's built in to my Galaxy Buds Live. Does it sound any different? And last but not the least, you can select between one of the three built-in microphones of the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. Right now, we're using the omnidirectional mode, so you should be able to hear not only my voice, but also uh, sound around me. But now let's switch to the front-facing microphone. Chai, my uh, videographer. Hi, Chai. Hello. So you should hear Chai's voice. It should be louder. How are you doing? And then now let's switch to the rear-facing microphone, and the microphone should be pointed at me, and the volume theoretically should be louder in my direction. You guys always ask to see video samples, so here's a quick montage shot around Brooklyn. Early next month, Microsoft is rolling out support for cloud gaming on Xbox Game Pass. And Samsung is a launch partner. I tried out the beta on the Note 20 Ultra, playing Ori Will of the Wisps and Forza Horizon, both of which played extremely well, both on Wi-Fi and 5G. And while I would much rather play these games on a larger screen, it was nice to know that if you do feel like it, say you're on the go, you can play these games on your Android smartphone too. Cloud Gaming on Xbox Game Pass launches on September 15. The Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra packs a 4,500 milliamp hour battery. 
In my tests using my Snapdragon 865 Plus Powered Note 20 Ultra, it got me through the whole day with a little leftover on most days, and at least right till the very end on some others. It wasn't as long lasting as say the S20 Ultra, and I did notice a little bit of battery drain even while on standby. That said, it was sufficient enough for my needs, and I didn't find myself wanting. Charging times were pretty decent also. With the bundled 25 watt USB-C charger, I got to 58% in 30 minutes and 94% in an hour. A full charge took just 70 minutes. Using Samsung's optional 15 watt wireless charger stand, the phone got to 22% in 30 minutes, 48% in an hour, and a full charge took two hours. Now, this is just me nitpicking, and I know Samsung has been burned before, but this is one of my biggest complaints about the phone. I really wish that wireless charging speeds were faster. I'd love to get a fast 10 minute top up to say 50% for days when I forget to charge and have a long night out planned. And we're starting to see phones charge as fast wirelessly as they do plugged in. And I only say this because the Note is supposed to be your no compromises smartphone. Now I wasn't going to cover this next segment until I saw how loud the anti-Exynos sentiment was on social media. So let's discuss. You see, in the US, we have the Snapdragon 865 Plus variant of the Note 20 Ultra, while in Europe and most parts of Asia, they get the Exynos 990 variant. Now, this isn't something necessarily new. In the past, Samsung has produced Exynos and Snapdragon variants of many of its smartphones, but the disparity between the two hasn't been as big as it is today. Some say the Exynos 990 has been plagued with heating issues, Snapdragon 865 and 865 Plus benchmark better, which my BFF Tom the Tech Chap covers in his video. And anecdotally, battery life on the Snapdragon variants are better too. In my two weeks, I average between five and a half hours to about six and a half hours of screen on time, while Tom and SuperSaf in the UK were getting closer to four hours. Now it's worth pointing out that Exynos variants come with double the amount of storage for the same price, but I can understand the frustration of those who don't live in the US. After all, you buy the note to get the best of the best. Having said that, there isn't anything substantially wrong with Exynos 990. I guess the bigger problem is the fact that you know that there is something better out there and that kind of messes with your human psyche. Samsung needs to acknowledge this and address this in the future. Ever since Samsung introduced DeX, I've always thought it was a cool idea, really showing off the power of a smartphone by turning it into its own portable computer. Over the years, we've seen it go from dock to cable, and now DeX works wirelessly with any TV or monitor that supports Miracast. Just swipe down from the quick settings panel and tap on DeX. If you own a TV that supports it, it should appear as one of the options. Corey Perez asks, can we use a cable still? The answer is yes. It works just like on previous devices. You can pair a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse and plug it into an external monitor. Is there a significant amount of latency when using wireless mode? It really depends on what you're doing. There is a little bit of latency, but you can really feel it when you do things like gaming. That said, I believe Samsung has a more appropriate use for DeX, and that's as the operating system for the new Galaxy Tab S7 Plus. Let me know if you want a video on that device also. It's now time for some buying advice. Should you buy the Note 20 instead? There's currently a lot of talk about the cheaper Note 20 being overpriced because of its plastic back and its 60 hertz display. I haven't really used that phone, so I'll need to get my hands on it to be able to give you an answer. I see that Samsung was trying to offer a cheaper version of the Note 20, but I can understand why fans feel this way, considering the Note line has never been associated with the word compromise. However, 990 is the same price as the entry-level S20, so this is definitely a value buy. Should you buy the Galaxy S20 Ultra instead? The Galaxy S20 Ultra is currently more expensive than the Note 20 Ultra, I'm not sure why. It has a bigger battery, but the Note 20 Ultra also has the S Pen, updated processor, and fixes the S20 Ultra's biggest flaw. 
Overall, I think the Note 20 Ultra is the better buy. It probably also has a slightly better resale value. The only thing I like better about the S20 Ultra are its rounded corners. That said, the Note 20 Ultra really is more refined and premium. Finally, Mr. Manager asks, if I have the Note 10 Plus, do you think it's worth upgrading? Is the Note 20 Ultra a worthy upgrade? Definitely yes, but unless money is not an issue for you, then I'm never one to recommend upgrading from last year's phone, regardless of brand and model. Before we wrap up, it's quick fire Q&A round. Kelheimer asks, I need to adjust the focus without touching the screen. Can the S Pen do this? Nope, it can't. JCell, is it waterproof or shockproof? The Note 20 Ultra is IP68 rated, so it is water and dust resistant, but it is not shockproof. Sham asks, would you need an Xbox console to play the Xbox games or just pay for a subscription? Nope, you don't need a console, just pay for the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscription as long as you live in one of the 22 countries where it will be initially available. Samson Thomas asks, nice wallpaper, where can I download it? Our Note 20 wallpapers are all available on gadgetmatch.com slash wallpapers. So, is the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra your gadget match? If you're looking for an affordable value for money smartphone, I'm sorry, look elsewhere. The Galaxy Note 20 Ultra belongs in a completely different category. I stand by what I said earlier on in this video. While the Note 20 Ultra may not be the most extra specced out phone in the Android world today, if you think about all the other phones pushing boundaries, this one is the most refined, the most balanced. On my list of non-negotiables, it not only ticks every box, it satisfies each category extremely well. And on my list of optionals, the only thing I wish it had but doesn't is fast wireless charging. And while we're talking about things we'd love to see, I'd love it if the selfie camera didn't brighten my face so much and punch in so close when shooting videos. Those are my only asks for now. If the Apple world has the iPhone 11 Pro Max, the Android world has the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. Overall, it's currently the best Android phone money can buy. And for that, it merits the Gadget Match seal of approval. Of course, if money isn't an issue and you want something that feels more of the future, then there's the Galaxy Z Fold 2, which I've already put in an order for, but is still in price as of right now. At Samsung's last unpacked event, they talked about how the Galaxy Z Fold 2 does not have pen support, but could get it in the future if users ask for it, which makes me wonder. The Galaxy Note 2, my first phone, could the Galaxy Note 20 be my last? And could the next Galaxy Note actually have a foldable display? Or will the Galaxy Z Fold 3 come with an S Pen? Let me know what your thoughts are by leaving a message below. As always, subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos and hit the bell icon so that you get notified first. Follow me on social media for all the behind the scenes fun stuff. And as always, make gadgetmatch.com your daily habit. Until the next video, I'm Michael Josh. Thanks for dropping by.